Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this first installment of the Four Year Discernment webinar series. My name is Megan Coakley, and I'm the director of the Office for the New Evangelization for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Um, and I'm going to explain kind of how this webinar is going to go and a little bit about the series. But first, why don't we start with prayer so we can uh, put Jesus at the center of what we're doing and talking about. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we praise and worship you. And we ask you to open your sacred heart to us to pour out your Holy Spirit and to give us every grace that we need to do your will in our parishes. And Jesus, we want to conform our will to your will and to make you the center of everything that we're doing in our parishes. And we ask you to give us grace of discernment and wisdom to hear your voice and know how it is that you're leading us in our parishes so that we can bring many, many more souls to your heart. We pray all of this and we consecrate this time to you through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So just a few logistical uh, points here. There is a chat box available to you that you'll be able to use at the end of my presentation to ask any questions that you might have. And so um, just so you're aware of that, I'll explain how to open up your chat box when we get to the end. As well, the webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to uh, watch and review this over and over if you want or share it with other people. Also, you can see hopefully my face in a little uh, video window, but if, if it's getting in the way of the slides because we're going to be using slides for this presentation you can just hover over that video and click the little minimize bar and that will make my face disappear so that you can actually see the slides so just know that you have the option to uh, move me out of the way if you need to <laughs> so a little bit about this series so it's called for your discernment and the really the purpose is to offer to you parish leaders clergy deacons lay lay folk uh, religious sisters discernment information materials about what is available to you to launch an evangelization movement in your parish to, as I prayed, bring souls to Jesus Christ. And so today's presentation is really just a summary, um, getting the lay of the land of parish evangelization. What are the principles that should be governing a launch of a movement or the, the implementation of a movement? What are the things that must be in place no matter what tool you use? And then the next three webinars will be introducing three specific tools that can help you launch a movement. And each of those is designed to just give you the necessary information so that you can discern which of those might be the best for your parish. Every parish is different, different needs. Um, and so it's really up to you to discern. We just hope to provide you with content to, to discern over. Um, and so at the end, I'll just remind everybody of the next dates. And so um, let's get started. So Today, we're just talking about the overarching vision of evangelization in a parish. And so we're going to start with this very famous quote from Pope Paul VI. Evangelization is the grace and vocation proper to the church. She exists in order to evangelize. So this, this quote is so absolutely critical for understanding the mission and the purpose of the parish. If anybody ever wanted to know, what is Jesus's will for my parish? This is it. <laughs> so there's, in a sense, no question about that. Evangelization, this is the Holy Father saying, the evangelization is the grace and vocation proper to the church. She exists to evangelize. And that means not just the church universal, but your parish. Your parish exists to evangelize. So what is evangelization, right? We need a nice working definition there. The, the simplest way to understand evangelization is our task, our mission from Jesus Christ to bring people into a personal and intimate encounter with Jesus in the heart of the church. So that's important. One, one thing that we always wanna to keep together is it's not Jesus and then the church. It's that Jesus is encountered personally and intimately inside the life of the church and the parish exists to mediate and to facilitate that encounter between the person and God on a heart to heart level. So that is the purpose of the parish. It's, it's the purpose of what we're talking about for the next um, four weeks 
And so the primary place where evangelization happens is the parish, right? That building that sits on the corner of, uh, like to use the cathedral as an example, 17th and race, actually that's not quite right, but anyway, that corner, right? The cathedral sits there in order to bring people into a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. One of my absolute favorite definitions of the church comes um, is this quote here that comes to us from the 2012 Synod on Evangelization. It is my favorite definition of what is the church, and you can really apply this to what is the parish. Listen to this. The church is the space offered by Christ in history where we can encounter him. So the church is something that Jesus establishes, something that he creates for the purpose of mankind being able to find him and meet him personally. So you think about that in the life of the church, all of the sacraments are exactly that, the sacramental life of the church and actually everything about the church and everything that happens in a parish should be, is meant to be a place of encounter between the human heart and Jesus Christ who loves that person infinitely. And so that's the purpose of your parish. You could even supplement where it says the church, you could just put my parish. <laughs> my parish is the space offered by Christ in history where we can encounter him, right? Maybe that make that your parish mission statement. See how that goes, how that's gonna formulate and transform everything that your parish does. So I wanna talk now just a little bit about what does launching an evangelization movement in a parish or what does maintaining and cultivating an evangelization movement in a parish look like? It's a multi-layered process and, and reality in a parish. So we're gonna look here, you can see these concentric circles and they basically outline the stages of the process of launching evangelization in your parish. Now, interestingly enough, most people that, I, that, that come to this realization of this mission to evangelize from Jesus, they come to the realization and they immediately want to do stage five right here. You'll see stage five, which is outreach to those who are far away from God. That's usually we kind of like we, we, we start to wake up to this mission and then we immediately want to just start outreach. That's actually not the first place to start. And this is really important. And why is that? Why is stage five not stage one? <laughs> because of this quote here on the right. Apart from me, you can do nothing, right? This is Jesus during the vine and the branches discourse. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And people sometimes joke, so the Greek word there for nothing means nothing. <laughs> so, so absolutely nothing. So in other words, our evangelization, evangelization in the parish, its power, its force, its efficacy, its ability to transform hearts, all of that comes from the heart of Jesus Christ. It does not come from us. The power of our ministry does not come from us. We are actually incapable of it. It comes from the heart of Jesus Christ. And so the first thing that must be present in order for evangelization to actually take off in a parish is down here at the bottom, my personal intimacy with Jesus Christ. I have to be in union with him. My heart has to be in union with Jesus Christ if anything that flows out of me is going to be effective and transformative for people. So parish evangelization starts at the number one battleground of my own heart, my own conversion to Jesus. And this has flesh on it, right? This means regular participation in the Eucharist, regular confession, regular prayer life, following the moral teachings of the church, right? Union with Jesus, ever greater union with him. This is where the power that is in the heart of Jesus Christ begins to then pour out of our own hearts as we're laboring to do this thing called evangelization, then you'll see that as I'm working on my own prayer life with the Lord and my own union with him, my own intimacy with him, stage one, discern that call, 
what does Jesus want my parish to do? And so that's going to involve talking, having conversations with your pastor, having conversations with the parish team, reading the church documents, reading the experts on these subjects. So discernment, discernment, discernment. So you'll see stage two and three is then gathering and forming people to do this with you. Evangelization is never, never, never a one man show. It can't be. Number one, you'll burn out. And number two, that is not God's will for us. So there has to be a team of people who are laboring together to do this. And then stage four is when you start to move out to the greater parish to start to stir up the fire and call people to begin to become better disciples of Jesus Christ and to start attuning them to that mission to go out and seek the lost. And then we get to stage five, which is the parish then begins to discern their outreach to those who are not coming to church. So what you'll notice about these stages, and I'm sorry I'm moving quickly, I have a docu document about this that spells this out uh, in greater detail. But the, the thing to notice about these stages is number one, they overlap with each other. It doesn't mean you have to only do one and then not two and then, you know, so you, they overlap with each other. It's a very organic process. But the second most important thing is that the process of evangelization, launching something in a parish takes time. It takes a lot of time. And, and I just wanna encourage everyone not to be afraid to take time to pray, discern, read, study, talk, really give time. And so, and I will tell you from my witness has been that the most successful parish evangelization movements, the ones that have lasted long-term and borne fruit rather than being just a flash in the pan that grows and then dies, those parishes are the ones that have taken actually a couple of years before they launched so that, that people met together, they prayed together, they studied together, they, they discerned programs together, and then they launched. And those have been the most successful and the most lasting evangelization movements. So just again, I just want to encourage everybody, don't be afraid to take time. You don't have to start outreach immediately. It's much better to work on these deeper stages, especially personal intimacy with Christ. That's what's going to be the foundation of anything that's effective as far as evangelization goes. So what is our task then? So I'm going to move into then the path of discipleship. How do we make disciples in a parish? What is the, what is the church outlined for us as far as the structure and the, uh, the journey, right, of making a disciple? The task, right? I want to first talk about the task, and then we're going to go through the stages of disciple making. What is our task? So our task as a parish, and this is a beautiful thing, is not to make people encounter Jesus Christ, <laughs> because we actually cannot make that happen. Who's the only person who can make a personal encounter with Jesus happen? Jesus himself, <laughs> right? Jesus has to reveal himself. He has to come for the person. He has to, to open their eyes. He has to make his love known and felt. So we as human beings are actually not capable of making that happen. So the question has to be, okay, well then in light of that, what is my job, right? What do I do to help make that happen? And here's what the church says. This is a great quote for really nailing down what is our job as parish leaders. Transmitting the faith means to create in every place and time the conditions which lead to this encounter between the person and Jesus Christ. Listen to this line. The goal of all evangelization is to create the possibility for this encounter. So in other words, as I said, our job is not to make the encounter happen. We are actually entirely dependent on God to do that. Our job is to create the conditions that are favorable to that encounter happening. So that's a conversation for parish leaders to have with each other. What are the conditions that dispose a person to being open to Jesus coming and revealing himself? What, what climate do we have to create in the parish? What opportunities do we need to make available to people so that they can have this encounter? And again, that, that's a conversation for another time to go into what are those conditions. But just so everybody has a sense of that is our task, no matter what ministry we're using, the task is to create the conditions that are favorable to the person having an encounter with Jesus Christ. 
So in light of that, knowing our task, I want to walk through with us the path of discipleship. So these are the stages of someone becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ that have been outlined for us by the church. Now, this diagram here is called the baseball diamond, and it's given to us by the evangelization ministry, Evangelical Catholic. So I'm very grateful to them for uh, letting me perpetually use this diagram because um, it's very helpful for, helpful for understanding the process that of evangelization that needs to be happening in all of our parishes. So what I'm outlining today are the stages and the process and the it's basically a planning structure for you to make sure that you have things available for parishioners at every stage of the disciple making process so that people can become a disciple, but also mature as a disciple, and then ultimately become a missionary disciple, which means they know that their mission in life is to go out and to seek the lost. So take a look at the baseball diamond with me. Down here at home plate, we have the world, right? So people who are in the world, they're not in the church, they're not with God. It's just your, your classic kind of secular person who is either a fallen away Catholic or just has never heard of Jesus or God ever, right? What do we have to do as a parish to bring someone from being a person of the world to becoming a believer, right? That's the first stage. Well, there's two basic uh, phases that the church outlines for moving someone from the world to becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. And that first stage is what the church calls pre-evangelization. So there's actually, we need to know this, this is very important. There's actually a stage before evangelization that we cannot ignore. Pre-evangelization is basically relationship building, right? Befriending the person that you work with, befriending your neighbor that lives in your parish boundaries, befriending the guy who delivers packages to your parish office, right? So building trust. All relationships, including the relationship with Jesus Christ, proceed according to the bonds of trust. So pre-evangelization is a very important moment of building friendship with someone and building a relationship of trust over time. So this can take, pre-evangelization can take a long time. And so this is important for ha having things in your parish like social events, right? Where people can just come who may not even be ready to talk about God, who can come and then having some people there who are committed to introducing themselves to the new guy and starting a friendship with them, right? So that's pre-evangelization. Now, as that relationship, that friendship with the person who's far away from God begins to build, the, 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 the missionary disciple is constantly on the lookout for the moment for when to begin to talk about God and to invite that person to an opportunity to encounter the Lord. And this is the second stage called missionary proclamation. This is, in a sense, um, the big moment, right? This is the moment where when the person is ready and the missionary disciple knows they're ready, the person is invited. They are, they're actually not even invited yet. First, they're told about Jesus. Who is he, right? The kerygma, the church calls this. So the proclamation of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is important with it, an invitation to that person to make a personal decision to follow Jesus, to put him at the center. And so we have to ask ourselves, is there an opportunity, an event, a ministry in my parish where, where, where people experience that, where they actually hear the kerygma and are invited to personally decide for Jesus. So, so and, and I want to say, many of our parishes do not have a moment like that, where we're, where we're very specifically inviting people to believe in Jesus, potentially even for the first time. And so that has to be our question, right? Is there a moment in my parish built into the ministries of my parish of missionary proclamation? Now, once a person makes that decision, they are a believer, and then they begin this process of which the, what the church will call initiatory catechesis. So early stage catechesis, it's very much the basics of the prayer life of the church, basic things like how to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit, how to read the scripture, what are the sacraments, what, you know, anyway, basic, basic early stage discipleship. Initiatory catechesis is really requires in this stage one-on-one -on -one accompaniment 
and apprenticeship. So this is really important. In this stage, there need to be someone who's walking with this new disciple one-on-one, -on -one, helping them along their journey. This is not spiritual direction. They don't have to be theologians. They don't have to be priests for this. These are just people who themselves are following Christ, who are willing to walk with a newer follower of Christ into the very early stages of the Christian walk. After initiatory catechesis, we get into the whole gamut of what the church would call perfective catechesis. So this is the deepening of our life in Christ. So this is the, the deep moving into the deeps of teachings about our doctrines, the church's moral life, the, de the deeper uh, teachings about our sacraments and our the spiritual life. Um, this is where a lot of inner healing and deliverance can come in. So this is this is the, this is basically the, the lifelong process, right? The, the perfecting of our discipleship over time. As a person is being perfected, they also need to be equipped to go on mission. So it's not enough to be a disciple. One must become a missionary disciple. It is an essential part of discipleship to have that mind of Christ to go out and seek the loss. And so there needs to be a phase where disciples are being intentionally and formally taught how to build relationships how to share the kerygma, how to know when someone's ready for that and when they're not, right? Um, how to issue an invitation, right? So, so people need to be taught that. And then as those disciples become workers, there then needs to be a very intentional sending of the workers out into the world after the loss. So that's again, where it's kind of people are commissioned, go knock on your neighbor's door, right? Go talk to your coworker at the water cooler, go initiate a conversation with the mailman next time he brings the mail, et cetera. So that's sending out back into the world to begin this process. Now you'll see in the center, the furnace for this process is the sacramental life of the church. So everybody who is involved in this process, the ministry leaders that are conducting in a sense and, and facilitating this path of discipleship, those people need to be in union with the sacramental life of the church because that is where the heart of Christ pours out the power and the efficacy and the transforming uh, grace that is needed for these stages to be real and not, not just lip service, right? So just knowing that the, the sacraments are there in the center. So I wanna talk now about the tools. This is kind of setting us up for the next three webinars. There are many ministries out there around the country, in fact, across the world, that can help a parish launch this movement, right? So to make sure that all, in a sense, all of these bases are covered, that there are opportunities in your parish that are moving people from these early stages into these mature stages and then sending them out into the world. And so I just wanna quickly go over with you what these tools are and what they offer and where they sit on the baseball diamond. So you can just get a sense of the way that you can develop a strategic plan in your parish to make sure that this path of discipleship is being um, observed and implemented and made available to your people. Okay, so here are some ministries that offer tools and content for this early stage of missionary proclamation. So Christ's life's first phase, and you'll learn about these things in the upcoming webinars. So I'm not gonna explain what they are now. I'm just gonna list them off and you're gonna learn about them in the next few weeks. Christ's life's first stage called discovering Christ, CCO's first stage called discovery, evangelical Catholic small groups, focus, Bible studies and Alpha, the Alpha program with some tweaks. There's, there's some tweaks that have to be uh, added there because Alpha is not Catholic, so it needs a little bit of adjustment. But those ministries are specifically designed to proclaim the person of Jesus Christ, the kerygma, and to invite a person to decide for him. In other words, they're designed to create the conditions for the person to have a first time or a renewed encounter with Jesus Christ. So there's multiple options that enable that missionary proclamation for, uh, for your parish. Okay, so what are the options for then this initiatory catechesis moving into perfective catechesis stage? Christ Life, again, has a second stage called following Christ. CCO has two stages in this area called source and growth. 
Evangelical Catholic has small groups. Steubenville has their discipleship quads. And then there are healing ministries and, and deliverance ministries that can help unbind the heart so that people can continue to move forward in Christ. All of these do the same thing in different ways, which is to begin to apprentice people in the very early stages of discipleship and following Jesus Christ. And you can hear how, in a sense, genius these ministries are. They know what they're doing, right? They're, they're, they're developing things that move people right along this path of discipleship. So no matter which one you choose, each of them is going to have that same goal of moving people along this baseball diamond. So what are what things are out there for this st third stage of perfective catechesis? There's actually a ton of stuff for this stage. So CCO has a, a third stage called, uh, sorry, it's fourth, their fourth stage called trust. Steubenville discipleship quads also move people deeper into this perfective catechesis. And then there's also just the ministries that I think you're probably very familiar with. Basically, almost all the content on formed.org, Bishop Barron's content, Ascension Press, other faith formation ministries and content that's out there. All of that is designed for perfective catechesis. Interestingly enough, most parishes, if they offer anything, right, some don't, but if they do, and many of them do, they're typically offering content and programs and ministries in around perfective catechesis. The problem with that is that we're assuming that everyone is already a disciple and has a prayer life and has met Jesus and has already has that intimacy with him. And in fact, that's a lot of times not the case. So, so a lot of times in our parishes, we're offering things for very mature disciples when in fact, a lot of our people are actually still down here in phase one, pre-evangelization missionary proclamation. So that's what we need to start attending to is are we offering things that are maybe a little bit beyond where people are at right now and not actually transforming their hearts and their lives, right? That's a question we need to be asking ourselves. Okay, so what are the resources out there that then move people to become missionary, right? Equipping disciples for mission and sending them out. So again, Christ life has a third phase called sharing Christ. And that is explicitly designed to teach people how to evangelize other people. <laughs> CCO's growth and commission, those are two stages in, in CCO. Those do the same thing. Evangelical Catholic has a, an comprehensive leader training program where they actually form people to go out and lead small groups and evangelize. And so their leader training is excellent for this phase. You may also be aware of the Revive ministry training platform that we just launched here in Philadelphia. Revive has all kinds of training for ministry skills development. This would be the time that you would be using Revive is once you've got your, your truly converted disciples, then you start to train them and equip them for mission. Called and Gifted from the Siena Institute. That one is helping to discern personal gifts and charisms so people can, can hear from the Lord how he made them, right? And, how, and what he has given them, the gifts he's given them to call them out into mission. Ministry 23 also has a series called Relit, and that's a basic training series in the new evangelization. So there's a lot of different ways that this can be done. It's just a matter of knowing which ones do what, and then making sure that at each stage of the process of discipleship formation, we as a parish are offering something to people so that they can in fact progress and be transformed and eventually themselves be sent forth. So almost uh, finished here, just going to talk a little bit about, so what are the essentials, right? In parish evangelization, what are the, in a sense, what I want to say is when we boil everything down, what are the things that must be in place in order for this to work? And when I say work, I mean change hearts, right? Because that's what Jesus is after. So we're going to talk first about the individual person who's evangelizing. So this could be your parish leaders. This is your pastoral council. This is your priest. This is your uh, parish staff. So these are the essentials for, for those people. And then we're going to talk about the essentials that have to be kind of present in the culture of the parish. So for the individual evangelizer, Right, as you would probably have guessed by now, it is absolutely essential for each person to have their own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And as I said, that is a relationship that's in the heart of the church. 
So regular mass, regular confession, regular prayer life, right? Aligning their will with the will of Christ as far as morality goes. Um, and that, right, the person doesn't have to be perfect, right? But they need to have that, that general conformity, that will to be conformed to Jesus Christ ever more and more. Okay, second essential for the individual evangelizer is relational health. Why am I saying that? Because evangelization proceeds by means of relationship. Remember how I told, how I mentioned about that stage of pre-evangelization is all about building friendship. So the question has to be, are the people who are in a sense overseeing evangelization in my parish, are these people capable of healthy relationship? Are they capable of listening? Are they capable of self-sacrifice? Are they uh, domineering, right? That's not a quality that should be in an evangelizer, right? Is it a person? So, so relational health, in other words, virtue, right? You need to, we, the person needs to manifest the Christian virtues um, in order to effectively build relationships that will be life-giving for the person that's being discipled and evangelized. The person has to be mission driven, right? So to understand, to have that working knowledge and sense of this mission from Jesus Christ to evangelize. It doesn't mean they need to know all the theology, but they have to have that kind of instinctual sense that Jesus has called us out to mission. Now, part of this is the person may not have this, but it can be nurtured into people, right? Especially a sense of mission. There's a great um, acronym that you can use to describe the qualities of a person who is evangelizing the, the qualities you're looking for to be a part of your team, for example, or part of your parish staff. And that is the acronym FACT. So the person needs to be faithful to Jesus Christ and the church. They need to be available. So that means they have to have time, right? They can't be busy all the time or too much on their plate because they won't be present then to the people that they're serving. They have to be contagious. So do they have an attractive personality? Are they kind? Are they joyful? Are they in love with their faith? And they have to be teachable. This is really important. Unfortunately, in the church, we have a lot of Catholic know-it-alls. <laughs> know-it-alls are not good evangelizers because they're not listening. They're only talking and they're only teaching. So that's really important to make sure that the people you're gathering for your team are also docile and, 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 and uh, capable of surrender and capable of listening. Okay, so those are the essentials for the individual evangelizer. Now, what about the parish? So here are the essential things for a parish to truly become evangelizing. So the first thing is the parish needs a, criti a critical mass of fact people. <laughs> so, and if you don't have those people right now, you can, you can cultivate them by using some of the ministries we're gonna be talking about in the next three weeks. When you run these ministries, what they do is they cultivate fact people. So, so you, can, you can use these tools not only to do outreach beyond the borders of the parish, but you can do this internally to the parish to begin to build up a critical mass of people who are on fire for Jesus Christ and know how to love other people. All right, another essential for the parish. It must be understood in the parish atmosphere that evangelization is the central mission of the parish. This includes the pastor and the staff of the parish. It can't be, in, all right, so, so it can't be to be truly effective, to really have, create something that lasts. It can't be the one on fire layperson driving evangelization while the parish staff and the pastor are just, I don't know, doing something else and don't care, right? So, so that happens, right? And actually I've seen many people accomplish that and it goes and it, it can happen, but the real fruit, the real fruit comes when the pastor gets it and the parish staff gets it. And if they don't get it now, bringing them into some of these ministries may help bring them along. Sometimes when people start to see the fruit and they start to see the joy and they start to see these new volunteers appearing from nowhere because of this awesome ministry, a lot of times you can win them over. But that's the goal is that everybody in the parish understands evangelization as the central mission of the parish. Another essential, basically this, these two things are what make up any good evangelization ministry small groups and one-on-one -on -one accompaniment. Having what, whatever ministry you choose to work with, 
if these two components are built into that ministry, it's probably going to be pretty effective. Again, why? Because evangelization proceeds by means of intimate relationship. And so small groups, and I mean, you know, intimate small groups where relationships are forming, right? And hearts are, are being opened and people are sharing. And that one-on-one -on -one accompaniment with the mentor or the disciple or walking with the early stage believer, those two things are, are where the power is, right? And that's sometimes not gonna bring big numbers at first. So we have to not be afraid to let go of our need for big numbers. That's uh, because, um, anyway, these, these are the two things that really bring about authentic lasting conversion. This is another one that's really important for the parish. In order for that path of discipleship model to work, there must be a collaborative spirit between ministries to move people ever deeper into Christ. So what do I mean by that? Parish ministries, we need to let go of our territorialism. And so if somebody right in an early stage ministry is ready to move on to something that's going to deepen their faith in Christ, that ministry leader needs to be willing to help them move on to, to the ministry that's going to deepen them and make them more and more mature disciples. And so our ministry leaders must understand and we need to stop grasping after people, but working with them, serving them, and then helping them move forward. And if that means leaving your ministry to join another ministry, we need to be actually very happy to do that. So not just tolerate it, but we need to actually be very happy about that because the goal is always someone becoming ever deeper uh, conformed to Jesus Christ. This is where we need pastors to step in big time. Pastors need to foster that collaborative spirit to help ministry leaders understand that their goal is not, their, their particular ministry is not the end in itself, right? Union with Jesus Christ is the end. And to the extent that that ministry is just a conduit and maybe one stage of that process, all ministry leaders need to have that kind of detachment to let people move along that baseball diamond. So with that, I'm going to stop here. That was just a quick summary. I know it was a lot. You'll get to listen to the recording and I can also share the slides. But what I'm going to do now is open up the chat box. And if anybody has any questions, uh, you can feel free to do that. So right now, okay, the chat box is open. So feel free to open up your chat box. Just hover over the video screen and you'll, you'll see a little button that says chat. You can just click on that and then type in your question to me and I will respond to it. Um, while we're waiting for that also, as you're looking at the screen, you can see my email address there. So if you want to email me any of your questions later, please feel free to do that. And as well, our next webinar. So the next three webinars are gonna introduce the, those three kind of major evangelization ministries that operate here in the archdiocese and that I definitely highly recommend for any parish to consider to bring to their parish to launch something. So uh, let's see, Wednesday, January 13th is our next one. That one will be on the Christ Life series. January 20th, we'll cover Evangelical Catholic. And then Wednesday, January 27th is gonna be CCO or Catholic Christian Outreach. Um, and so just so everybody knows, you'll get a summary of all of those different um, ministries and, and how they work and what they cost and what's the time commitment and pros and cons. And you'll really get a good sense of um, each of them. Okay, so I see some questions coming in here. So let me see what we got. Okay, Megan, you said you had a paper on the steps of evangelization. Can you share that? Yes, I will send it to you. It's called the Guide for Launching Parish Evangelization Ministry in Your Parish. And I will make sure to send that to everybody. It goes through those concentric circles and it gives like specific recommendations of how to do each of those stages. Okay, let's see. All right, when you say ministries, I keep thinking in the realm of liturgical ministries, what is the definition of ministry that you are referencing? Well, ministry would really just mean like any service that the church is offering in the name of the church. So it's so ministry is a very broad term and it really just means the church is act of outreach. Um, and that can be social service ministry. That can, So liturgical ministry is just one area of ministry, but there are uh, many different types of ministries that exist in the church. Um, so anyway, I'm just using a very, very generic term. 
Um, okay, Father, let's see, great question. How do you keep small groups connected to the parish and not branch out on their own? That is a great question. So the biggest thing, right, small group leaders are critical for this. And so that's why like when we're choosing our small group leaders, they really do need to have those essentials that I listed, right? For example, if you get someone who's not teachable, right, they have all the other qualities, but they're not teachable, what's going to happen, right? They're going to be the type that like it's their feet, their little, their small group becomes their little fiefdom, right? And so what you're going to get is just generally then a kind of stubbornness, which could potentially lead that group out of the parish. So that's why actually being really in a sense, I, I want to, we're not very good at this as, as a church, but being selective about the people that we choose, we do unfortunately tend to get kind of desperate for leaders. And so we just put anybody in leadership positions, some of whom don't belong there. And so some of that is to not be afraid to make sure that we're choosing the correct leaders who have that docility and um, belief in, the, in the, the authority of the pastor and the primacy of the parish as the place of encounter with Jesus Christ. And then I also think there's ways that you can just bring the groups back to meet in the parish. Sometimes you could have the meetings in the parishes. The other thing with ev specifically evangelizing small groups, which are different from other small groups, evangelizing small groups are designed to be outward focused and to grow. So they are intentionally not supposed to become cliques, right? So the same six people all the time, right? Those people are actually going to be sent out at some point to start their own group. And I think also avoiding that click mentality will also prevent groups from kind of becoming too independent. Um, and so I think, I think there's a couple of dynamisms there that can prevent that from happening. And Father, I'm happy to talk more with you about that, but I would say leadership choice is going to be one of the number one things that prevents that from happening. Um, oh, great question. What to do about ministry leaders who should step down but, but won't? They seem unfaithful but resistant to give up their position or power. This is where courage comes in and they need to be told to step down. I mean, and that's unfortunately that's up to the pastor. So the pastor has to do that. No one else can do that except the pastor. So the problem is if the pastor won't do it, um, there are ways you could maybe work around that. But ideally, ideally, if we really understand and really want change in our parishes, we have to be willing to do the hard work of, of relieving someone of their duty. You can do that tactfully, you can do it charitably, but sometimes it just has to be done. Um, now, I will say as well, if you don't have a pastor that's willing to have that conversation with that person, what I would suggest is, is <laughs> I, I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it because it's a great tactic, outbuild them. So, so start another ministry and, and do, it, do it in Christ and, and let it shine and um, the fruits will show themselves. So anyway, I, yeah, <laughs> I hope that's helpful, Laura. Feel free to email me on that one. Um, Okay, where does offering service to the community fall in faith formation? You know what, I would say that, first of all, I think that can sit anywhere along the path of discipleship because that is outward focus. And in fact, um, you know, that pre-evangelization stage can often be where social services can have a beautiful place in the salvation of souls, right? Like you think about Mother Teresa's sisters, the missionaries of charity, they offer, you know, soup kitchens, they have um, homeless housing, things like that. But they're always making sure that they're providing for the, the basic needs of the people, but they're also giving them Jesus Christ. They're also making that like very early stage invitation to know the Lord. So I think that social services there, well, first of all, they're just a huge fruit of the life of the church, but they also can be a part of the evangelization process if we're doing them with a Christocentric mindset, that, that mission-centered mindset. So I'm sorry, there's more to be said about that, but that's my basic comment there. Can components of each ministry, Christ Life, EC, CCO, be mixed in a parish, or is it best to pick one and only use that throughout? That is a great question. They can be mixed. I don't recommend it only because there are, I would say, kind of unique themes and charisms that each one is teaching you for the entire, for each of the different stages. So I just think you probably run into a bit of confusion if you're learning the Christ Life model and then you switch over to EC. On the other hand, I have to say, what I have seen is that some of these ministries 
tend to be like pre precursors that a parish might use for a couple of years to build up their critical mass of fact people, for example. And then they kind of find that ministry plateaus and then they switch over to something else. So it doesn't mean they can't feed, they, here's one thing I will say, they absolutely feed off one another. They, are, they all have the exact same mission and they themselves would say that about each other, each of them, they're very complimentary. But just for the sake of not creating confusion as far as like principles and charisms of the specific ministries, I wouldn't recommend taking more than one on at any time. Uh, okay, given the limitations po uh, posed by COVID, can these ministries be carried out online? Absolutely. And in fact, for the next three weeks, each of the presenters, once they've outlined the ministry itself, they're going to talk at the end specifically about how to do it now during COVID. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And there are parishes that are doing these things now. And, and uh, to my surprise, because I'm not like super convinced about evangelizing online, despite the fact that I run a rosary and do this webinar, <laughs> But talking with the parishes, there is tremendous fruit happening uh, by doing these ministries uh, online. So it's definitely happening. Can you speak about ministry leaders that do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Absolutely. I have to say, if, if we want to be really honest with ourselves, that may be more often the case than not, because otherwise I don't know why we would be dying the way we are. Um, and so, but I, what I want to say is this, if a ministry leader does not have a personal relationship with Christ, it doesn't mean they, they need to be pulled. What it means is they need to be invited into an experience of discovering Christ. They need to be invited into CCO's discovery series. We want to try as much as we can to, to bring someone in um, before we would have to pull them, right? There are people who need to be pulled and we know it. And it's not, it has nothing to do with their spiritual life. It usually has to do with their personality, <laughs> but nonetheless, right? So that's an honest thing. But many people just never have been invited to know Jesus. They didn't, most people who, who serve in the church don't even know that's possible for them. So what I would say, and one thing you can do with ministry leaders is just like take everybody on a retreat and take them through, um, uh, CCO's discovery or take them through discovering Christ. There's way, anyway, I, I would start there. Um, but it, what, what that requires is being honest with ourselves that, 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 that is probably more often the case than not. And again, a lot of this, if parish renewal is going to happen, it's going to happen if we start being honest. And sometimes that requires, um, facing some difficult truths, even about ourselves, right? So we have to start with ourselves and our own lack of conversion. Um, let's see, will you send the Zoom invites to all attending today or do we need to register further? Yes, yeah, so if you wanna attend the next three or any one of them, you do need to register for them separately. And yes, what I'll do is I'll send you the link uh, for each one of them because they are all standalone events. So um, you need to register for them separately. Um, okay. How can we introduce this to our pastor who doesn't seem to be interested in extending evangelization ministries to the parishioners? Is there a video or a way to send this webinar to help convince pastors? Um, I guess a few things you can do here. Number one, number one, number one, pray for your pastor. Pray, for, just pray, pray for him. And, and right, Jesus, Jesus's timing is totally not our own. So, I mean, the no that comes from your pastor can often be Jesus just saying, hold on, just be patient, just wait. So, but pray for your pastor. Yes, you can send him this video. There's other stuff out there. But what I would say is, as long as you get the green light from your pastor to just start something, I would say, go ahead with that. Work with what he's willing to give you and work with a small team of people and watch how they're set on fire. Your pastor is going to see that and it's going to start to convince him. Most pastors are, 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 are good natured, right? They have a, a good will. And so, but I think a lot of, a lot of pastors understandably are kind of tired of another program, right? So they need to see that this is not just another program, that this is actually something that changes lives. They might start hearing the difference in the confessional that might win them over. So I would just say, again, start with what he's willing to give you and don't be afraid to work small. Don't be afraid to work with two, three, four people and spend a year just working together closely and, and, and moving in this direction. And you'll be surprised at what Jesus will do in the heart of those who, who have to make decisions. Um, okay, it looks like somebody just asked a similar question. 
Okay, do you have any examples or suggestions of how to bring all members of the parish staff together into the shared mission of creating an evangelization parish? You know, there's a few parish leaders ha that have done this in a, in a few different ways. And so um, I can I can fill you in on some of that. But what I would say, like one thing that I do, I do very simply is I offer a little half day workshop for ministry leaders, where I would come to the parish and you would gather your ministry leader heads and just give basically an introductory presentation to evangelization as the central mission of the parish, and then help the ministry leaders start to discern and see what that needs to look like in their specific ministry, because it's always going to look different depending on what their ministry is, and their their um, purpose is. So there's little ways to do that, and it wouldn't have to be necessarily my talks. You could do that with some Bishop Barron videos on evangelization. You could use Relit Ministry series. There's a couple of different series that you could use that could just you basically, I would say, get them together in a room, space them out for now, right during COVID, and then and then and then teach like learn together and pray together, pray together, pray together. If you can bring in some adoration. Um, that would be really key for helping bring the ministry leaders along. Um, okay. All right. Well, uh, someone is reminding me to invite everybody. You are certainly welcome. So we started these quarterly holy hours called um, the Holy Hours with the Good Shepherd. And it's at those holy hours that we are getting in front of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, and praying for the shepherds of the church. So if you're one of those people who have um, experienced some discouragement around trying to start something in your parish and not able to get anything going, um, please feel free to come to those holy hours. I can send that as well when I do the follow-up email um, so that you can receive some encouragement from Jesus itself. Um, and someone's asking me, you'll come to the parish to get this started. Absolutely, <laughs> that's, what I, that's my job. So I can come and have conversation with whoever you want. I'm happy to come give a presentation on evangelization to your ministry leaders, your parish council, whatever you need, I'm happy to help you get started. Um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna wrap us up here. Thank you everyone. I'm gonna send a follow-up email with everything I talked about and uh, the recording of this video. So it might take me an hour or two to, to get the recording downloaded, but why don't we close with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mother Mary, you are the star of the new evangelization, and we set our gaze on you as uh, making our navigation secure and straightforward and clear so that we know where to go. Mother, we're asking your intercession for us just to help us discern what is the will of God for our parish and mother obtain for us an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our own hearts, our families, our ministries, and our parishes. And let's pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you so much, everybody, and we will see you next week at one o'clock. God bless you.